without meditation we do not verify any of the truths that have been written in these books if we keep on reading the books and think we have reached somewhere we do not go anywhere it is like reading a guide book about hawaii and the waikiki beach and keep on reading every day you don't reach the beach you don't get the experience of the beach but we what we do with the scriptures is we keep on reading and we think that the reading is going to give us salvation that the more we read the more enlightened we are actually it can be the exact opposite of that the more we read the more egoistic we can become more arrogant we can become that we have read so much we argue with people i know more than you i have read all these books so reading of books does not always enhance our state of enlightenment sometimes it can hide our enlightenment behind our own ego and because reading itself can give us some guidelines can give us some indication what to do what you have to do what it says we read books we don't do what the books say so that's why it's very important to make this path experiential that means you must practice what you read must practice what you hear and that's why even in these short sessions we have here i always make it a practice that we should do some practical meditation we we'll do uh, some more today so that you get used to something that you will be doing every day as i explained yesterday and the day before the path is very simple the spiritual path is very very simple it's merely pulling our attention from this world and putting it within our own self behind the eyes it's as simple as that bulle shah one of the great mystics says rab da ki paana etho putna ethe laana he says how it's not difficult to find god just pull your attention from here and put it here he makes it so simple in one sentence and that's the truth but the difficulty only comes because when we try to put our attention behind the eyes all the different attachments we have created they are like ropes like little threads that are tying us down when we try to sit there every rope pulls us out and things we have forgotten we can remember when we try to meditate people we don't think of normally they all come to mind when we are trying to meditate is the pull of the outside attachments that makes it difficult though a simple process becomes difficult because of our mental attachments now the problem is that there is no way to practice detachment if somebody says from tomorrow i will not be attached to anything it doesn't work because the more you try to think of that to which you are detaching the more attached you get for example i loved shaky's pizza when i came here now supposing i want to say i don't want shaky's pizza i don't want shaky's pizza i'm thinking more of shaky's pizza actually i'm getting more attached you cannot practice detachment therefore it's been becomes a difficulty that attachment is creating a problem and we cannot practice detachment how do we go about it the answer is it is not the practice of detachment that can help us but the practice of an alternate attachment an attachment to something else and that happens all the time when we are attached to one thing and we get attached to another thing more attached to the other thing we forget the first one so it's the attachment that can create a detachment not the other way around so that is why there's another role that a perfect living master performs in our life that he enables a being a person like ourselves to be attached to so when we are attached to a master it automatically pulls our attachments away from others it is only by a new attachment that we can have experience of detachment and that is why the master's love has to be experienced by us we have to feel that pull and that pull comes from the unconditional love of a master his love is so unconditional very soon we begin to find 
This is something different. There is no judgment involved. There are no questions of whether you are good or bad involved. The masters know we are all good and bad. We all are good and bad. If you were not good and bad, we wouldn't be here. You have to be good and bad to be human. The masters know that. So the master is not making any judgment on who is good and bad. Their judgment is how long you have been trapped in this business of good and bad. How long you have been trapped in this law of karma here. How long you have been seeking to get out from this mess. And what a strong seeker you are. How intense is your desire to get out from here. On that basis they say, let's take you, take you back now. Your time has come. And when they do that, then they show unconditional love. The more you associate with a perfect living master, the more you feel the experience of an unconditional love that pulls you, that automatically attaches you to the master. And when you practice meditation, the dhyan, contemplation of the master, it takes you further into the master's attachment and the other attachments become detached. detached. So the practice of detachment is by experiencing an alternate, a different attachment. And that is why people sometimes do not realize that it is not easy to push away things, but you have to be pulled in the other direction, and then only you go. I also mentioned to you the importance of satsang, the importance of getting together and thinking of master, thinking of the spiritual path. Satsang is not where we just narrate stories. Satsang is we are remembering the master and the path helps us to concentrate our attention better when we meditate after that. Therefore, I also suggested that satsang should be followed by meditation. And when should you meditate? Question very frequently asked. Which is the best time to meditate? When we were in India, in the Dera, in great master's time, he used to say, that three o'clock in the morning is a very good time to meditate. The reason he gave for that time was that the dawn hasn't come and the day hasn't broken and everybody's sleeping, you are awake, you get a peaceful time to meditate. And by the time other people wake up, you have completed your morning, two and a half hours, two hours, whatever you can do in the morning, you have done it. He also recommended that in order to make the mind get habituated to the repetition of the Simran or the mantra, we should do a short session of meditation, maybe about half an hour before going to sleep. So he said you could break your meditation time between the early morning and before going to sleep. And that was a good idea. It, it worked. And somebody said, Master, said to the great master, Master, you are so powerful, you can give whatever you want. Why are you making these hungry, thirsty people wait so much and tell them, meditate, do this. Just go and give what you want to. Give the goodies you are carrying all the time. He said, I carry a basket of goodies every morning at 3 o'clock. And I carry it with me and I find everybody sleeping. Nobody is ready to take it. So I come back with the goodies in my basket. If people were awake, ready, ready to receive, I would distribute them there. For some people, he was particularly keen that we should get up in the morning at 3 o'clock. So he had his cane like this. He a better looking cane, but still a cane. And he would come in the morning at 3 o'clock in the summer. We were all sleeping outside on little cots. It was very hot. There was no air conditioning or anything there. So we used to have our little beds, cots taken out and we would sleep outside in the dera. And he would come walking with his cane and find us sleeping. He nudged us with this, wake up, three o'clock. And we say, oh, sorry, master. And we would get up and say, yes, we would sit up on the bed and look when he goes away. And you just turn the corner and we go to sleep again. <laughs> he was too clever, he would come back. <laughs> Come back again. I know you are <laughs> sleeping. And then we couldn't sleep after the second wakefulness. Those are experiences which we remember. Made him so human. Made him such a friend. Made him like different. 
made him a different kind of being for us. So, the best time is when there's least disturbance. But in those people living in big cities, there's disturbance all the time. There are jobs being done here in the West, which are different hours of work. So, he did say that depending upon your jobs, you can modify these timings. Supposing you have night duties, then you can't meditate at 3 in the morning. You meditate during the day. In fact, you can meditate any time you like. But the main emphasis was that the meditation by sitting up and closing your eyes and ears and going inside is only a small part of meditation. Meditation is a lifestyle. Meditation is not merely sitting up for a little while. Meditation is to think of the Master all the time. Meditation is to repeat the words of Simran all the time, whenever you can, to make it a habit for the mind. The mind has the habit of making habits. It gets habitual things. When the mind is habitually repeating those words, the words come automatically. And then you move to the next step. If the words, if your attention is in repeating the words, then you are losing a lot of your attention in the first exercise of trying to repeat the words. If you make your mind habituated to repeating the words by constantly repeating while walking, while cooking, while doing other things in life, then the, the mind repeats those words automatically. You can then move faster towards other things like conversation with the master during meditation, like thanking him for everyday happenings which look miraculous once we begin to see the great coincidences and miracles happening in our life. And we can immediately see that but for the Master's hand, those things would not happen. And we thank him for all those daily gifts that he gives us. All this is part of meditation. Even to thank the Master is part of meditation. So part of meditation is that we think about the Master, think about this, and that cultivates love and devotion. People ask me, then you constantly say, meditation should be done with love and devotion. It doesn't work otherwise. How can we develop love and devotion? And I say, you cannot develop love and devotion. You cannot develop love. Our experience of love is attachments to the world. Attachment is not love. There is a fundamental difference between attachment and love. In attachment, you are conscious of your own self. When you say, I love you. Do you realize that you're placing I before you and the I is, you're conscious of I more than you're conscious of you. And if the response is not good, after saying I love you, you can also say, then I also hate you. This is not love. This is trying to build an attachment. It's an ego trip. It's virtually ego trip when we talk so much of I doing things. I love this, I love that. The word love is being misused. It's only an ego trip for attachments. Love is when you forget the I and you only think of you. When the you occupies your consciousness and I is not there, that's love. I have tried to see what parts of consciousness, what activities in consciousness can take the ego back. Everything we do puts the ego forward. I have done this, I want to do this, I want to go there, I want to achieve this. I is there everywhere. The ego is there everywhere. The only thing that I found in the whole of life that puts the ego on the back bench is love. When you love somebody, the beloved takes the place of the I and the I is pushed back. Love is a very powerful thing. Love is the most powerful thing. But the love is, true, true love is where the beloved takes over even your ego and the I. And that's what happens. Since we are not practicing that, we don't know how to do that. Therefore, we cannot love. That how do we have love and devotion? We respond to the love of the Master. As we find in daily life, how Master is extending his love, giving us all the gifts that we get on a daily basis, and we respond to that, which is devotion. When we get devoted to a Master, then we have the experience of love and devotion. Love is a master's love for us. Devotion is our response to his love. That's why they always say love and devotion. They don't say only love or only devotion. They say do your meditation with love and devotion. 
It's an experience where when you experience the love of the master, that's the love, and you are devoted in response, that's love and devotion. It's love and devotion that really matters. How do you develop it? Just think of the master at all times. And even I said yesterday, have a conversation with the master. Some people pointed out to me yesterday that if we try to imagine the face of a master, we could go wrong because we could be just imagining a face and it's not the master at all. In fact, it could be our mind, it could be a negative power, it could be a negative entity misleading us. How can we be sure that we're just by imagining the master's face or the master's image that we are really in touch with the master and not deceiving ourselves through our mind and through any negative entities around us? The answer is already given, simple, that when the master initiates us and gives us these words to repeat, these words are charged with the power to prevent negativity from coming in. Any time you repeat those words, even an imaginary figure of master cannot come in. Try it out. The eyes and the forehead of a master will not appear if you are repeating the words given to you by a protective living master. Even if you try to imagine them. You can try it out. I, I and my friends have tried all our life. It doesn't work. Mind cannot make it up. If the mind can make it up, there's no charged words then. Why do we call the words of Simran charged by a master? Because that's the charge he does. That's the power he puts into those words and makes the magical words. They become magical because they do not allow any negativity to come in, not even one made up by your own mind. You cannot even imagine the eyes and the forehead of a master if you are repeating those words which the master has given us. Therefore, there is a safeguard. You will see that there is a safeguard provided to us throughout the spiritual journey. That may not, we may not go wrong. We may not go into negative territory. So long as the words charged as a simran given to us by a master are being repeated, we can't go wrong. Therefore, those words have to be repeated. If you habituate your mind to repeat those words, you're protected all the time. The mind keeps on repeating them. And you then do other things like conversations. It's a nice practice to see that the words are being repeated on top of it. You can still have a conversation with your master. And then you are sure you're having a conversation with the master. In the beginning, it is difficult to even imagine the face of a master completely. I, I recognize that. It takes time even for that. Though we think we can imagine any face, try to imagine the face of a master, it's more difficult than imagining any other face. Therefore, there is a difficulty in the beginning. But don't forget, even if you cannot see the master, and you are repeating the words, the master is there, but you cannot see. You can still talk to him, but you won't get an answer. Well, the answer could be made up by your mind, but you can still tell him what you want to tell. Don't wait for an answer. It's like prayer. When we pray, what do we do? We pray to God. Prayer is to ask for something and then stop. Prayer does not require an answer. Supposing you expect the prayer to be answered, that's a business transaction. It is not a prayer anymore. A prayer is one where you ask and leave it to God, to the Master, to anybody who you are praying to, to take care of it. So therefore, it's it's not a one-way conversation like we might think. It's just that we cannot hear the other side and we only see one way. So that is why when we have conversation, even in the beginning of our practice, one should not worry that you can't get the answers at that time. But answers do come. Answers come in the form of coincidences in your life. They come, as I mentioned yesterday, you open a book and the line, first line you read, is an answer to your question of yesterday. You wonder how it came. You're driving your car and there's an ad on a billboard on the road and it answers your question. And you wonder how this comes. Small, small things like this happen and they're, the actual context may be unrelated but a part of it is giving the answer. So you know there is something going on. Masters can give answers through coincidences. 
and they can give answers to many ways when they can't when you can't hear the answer directly in your head of course if you are able to establish the face of the master inside and hold it steady which takes time also i know during practice in the beginning the master face appears and fades sometimes seems to come near sometimes seems to go far eventually it settles down and becomes close and is always with you there the radiant form of the master once it appears is a permanent friend then you can have a complete conversation inside no need to look anything of course coincidences will keep on happening to tell you that the magic is going on that miracles are happening and the master is at work for you but but in any case you should be able to have a conversation with the master at that stage without any difficulty these are just different phases different stages great master said on the spiritual path don't be impatient don't be in a hurry we have been sitting in this state on born and reborn again and again for centuries for millennia maybe for millions of years we have no idea how long we have been trapped in this and to get out of it in a lifetime a couple of lifetimes in three four lifetimes in that context of the big time frame in which you have been trapped is nothing from the master's point of view it's a very short period to to go back in a lifetime whereas we get initiated we say master it's been two months i've got nothing but we're taking into months and we're taking into years whereas the problem that is being solved existed for millions of years so we have to be patient another reason for being patient if you are in a great hurry and you get an experience too fast it can be frightening because you're not used to it we are currently not aware of what happens to us after death therefore we are afraid of death almost everybody i meet is afraid of death so very few exceptions i see who say we are not afraid of death but those who are afraid of death when they meditate if the attention is pulled out too fast they feel they are going to die and they stop meditation it happened close in my own family my father who was such a good disciple of great master lek rajpuri when he got initiated and he had the first experience of the attention being pulled out he got so frightened that he was going to die he stopped meditation and he went back to great master and he said master i'm not going to do this meditation i was going to lose my life you didn't tell me that this meditation makes you really die <laughs> great master laughed and told him that look to the best of my knowledge nobody has ever died in meditation they have not even died in natural death in meditation secondly if if you die if your attention is pulled off what do you expect to see you expect to see you i expect to see the master then why are you worried why are you afraid then you go ahead and meditate don't do it in such a hurry don't be impatient take it stage by stage when you do meditation and the attention is pulled out stage by stage you lose your sense sense of where the hands and feet are next day you do the sense of where the legs have gone the next day you feel a little bored you get so used to it it doesn't bother you and by the time you are able to vacate your whole body by pulling the attention to the third eye center you don't mind it at all that's why great master himself recommended that you should do it stage by stage what he called darja ba darja in in punjabi he said darja ba darja jana chahiye not that you should and say i want to jump all the way i am impatient to see that because we are not used to it so there is a good hint given to us that don't be impatient take it easy and go stage by stage i also mentioned to the story of um, in a smaller gathering the story of baba jamal singh who was great master's master and he you you have heard the story before but i can repeat it again because it has some significance for us baba jamal singh as a candidate as a disciple of great mas of swami ji who was his master his master was swami ji said sibdial singh from agra he got initiated from there 
and he was living in Punjab. And Swamiji was living in Agra in Uttar Pradesh, UP, at quite a distance from Punjab. So it was not easy at that time to just travel all the time to go there. So they would make an appointment by writing letters. So Baba Jamal Singh wrote to Swamiji, Swamiji, I am suddenly feeling so much anxious to meet you. I am missing you so much. My heart wants to go run and see you. Please give me some time so I can see you. I am really missing you. He sent that letter. And Swamiji wrote back. Letters took a lot of time in those days. After a month, the reply comes. My dear son, Babu Jamal Singh, I am very happy to receive your letter. And I am very glad to know that your soul is roaming around in Khand Brahman. Jamal Singh said, my soul is going nowhere. This must be letter meant for somebody else. Swamiji might have made a mistake. And he thought it is for me. And he sent this letter. So he wrote again. He said, beloved master Swamiji, I must tell you, the letter you wrote to me was not for me because my soul does not go anywhere. I was just missing you and I'm still missing you. I just want to be with you. Please give me time to come to Agra and see you. After another wait of a month, another reply comes. My beloved son, Jamal Singh, I have received your second letter. I'm very happy to know that your soul is roaming around in Khand Brahman. So far as coming to Agra is concerned, come in the first week of next month, I'll see. With these two letters in hand, Jamal Singh goes to Agra and presents them to Swamiji. He says, Swamiji, these letters were not for me. Because my soul was not going anywhere. And you addressed them to me. Swamiji laughed and said, Jamal Singh, let us go inside and meditate for a little while. There were 10 or 12 people, disciples of Swamiji, sitting outside. They both, Swamiji and Jamal Singh, went inside the little hut that they had. And after about half an hour, they both came out. And then Swamiji asked, Jamal Singh, now tell me, when I wrote those letters, was your soul not going around in the higher regions? Jamal Singh said, yes, Master. Swamiji said, I am not asking if during this session of half an hour of meditation, your soul went up. I am asking, when I wrote those letters, was your soul not going into Khandramant? He said, yes, Master, it was at that time. Then Swamiji turned to the other people who were sitting there. And he said, when you miss your master so much that you can't do without going to see him, where is it coming from? It's the ascent of the soul inside. But you are blindfolded. You do not see where you have gone. The masters can blindfold you and let you do your worldly work. Whereas you miss the master so much. And that's coming from where? Coming from an ascent of the soul inside, a scent of attention inside. Outside, you don't see it because there is no spectacle. There is no vision about what is happening. And then Swamiji explained that masters deliberately do this sometimes so that your karmic work, the work you have to do in this world for your living, for your taking care of family, for taking care of your karmic obligations can be done because it may happen that if your attention goes and you see there, you may never like to come back and do anything. And then the whole karmic pattern gets postponed to another time. They want you to finish your account and they help you to finish the account. Masters help you to finish the account you have karmic account while you are still in this world and this is one of the ways of, ways of helping. They also lighten the burden in other things which is, if it is too much. But this is one way that they can put blindfolds so you don't get stuck there and say no, no, I can do the rest afterwards. They say no, finish your karma. It's, it's only a light karma because now it's not for all the previous karma. It's only for this one life's karma. What you have problem. Now, when you say it's only light karma, what do they mean by that? What they mean is when a perfect living master initiates, gives naam to a disciple, he at that very time destroys all the reserved karma held in a cloud. 
which is being picked up again and again to make our destiny for different lives. Therefore, the only karma left after initiation is the pralab, the destiny of this karma, of this life. And the only karma after that is what we create in this life. So it's a very light burden. The heavy burden was the sinchit karma, the reserved karma, sitting up in the cloud from where the time, time machine was pulling out karma and putting us into reincarnation again and again. That's not there anymore. Therefore, the karma becomes light. It's only the problem. It's only the, only the destiny for this one life that you are going through. And you do create more karma during this one life. And that, if you have to come another life, if a second life after initiation is indicated or you have to come, it's only based on the karma of the present life and not any past lives. So that's a very big advantage. And you get right up. Every time you have to come again after initiation, if you have to, it's always better, more conducive to meditation, more conducive to go on the spiritual path than before. So these are advantages. But when masters handle this problem of our karma, they make us go through it, but they do it in a certain way because they have a deal with the negative power that runs these three universes. Kal, the time frame, the time machine that's running these three universes. They, they, they are, there's a deal because we are, we are upsetting the time machine and pulling out souls from here. And therefore, they have said that we will not disturb the time machine. We won't disturb this universe of the three worlds. And therefore, they pull out. They say they pull out so smoothly, the souls. The example given is like pulling out a hair from butter. You know, if there's a hair stuck in a butter, but it's so smooth, you don't even know you pulled it out. The soul is pulled out from this three-world pattern of the mind and call and time, you know, like that smoothly. And for that, they do these wonderful things. They block anything that makes you feel, let me postpone this karma here and go away. Another thing they do, which many people don't like, is when there's a little heavy karma to go through, they disappear. Not a good sign. You, you say, this is the time when I needed you. And you can't find. As soon as that hump is over, they reappear. You say, Master, what happened? Oh, really? You had to go through that? Oh, don't worry. Now it's over. Because they feel that if they intervened, you would not like to go through that karma and just postpone it. This karma, karma is a strange thing. Karma consists of some strange elements which we don't realize. Karma is not a simple thing. Karma is not events. Karma can be emotional events, can be mental events, can be physical events. The problem we come with, the destiny we come with, consists of events like birth and death. Birth at a certain place. A fixed place which, over which we have no control. The previous karma is deciding where we are born, who will be our parents. And the whole thing sets off from there because we could be born in two different places and have entirely different kind of life. That's a very major event that where we are born with our past karma. Then we have accidents. We have coincidences, accidental meetings. We have married children. We have parents who are already there. We have relatives we have friends, we have occupations, jobs. Everything is laid out by the problem of karma, by our destiny for which we come, right up to our death. And death is also determined the same way. This pattern of a lifetime has all these events already fixed into it. But in between these events, there are gaps left of a different kind of karma, which is not problem, which is not destiny. We call them karema and karma. Kareman means it's a new opportunity for us to act. Those new opportunities that come again and again in our lifetime are the ones where we have choices, where we use free will, where we say, should I do this or not do this? Those gaps we fill up with our choice making. When we make a choice, that's the establishment of a new karma, which we have to pay off later on. 
Therefore, if you look at life, you will find that the gaps which we fill up are not so many as we think. The most of the events are prefixed, are already there, and within them are, we are operating to use our free will, our choice to fill up those gaps. When we fill up those gaps, depending upon how we make a decision, and when we make a decision, what moral value we give to that decision determines the nature of that karma. Supposing in making a decision, our conscience says, this is not good. You are doing something wrong. Nobody else is telling us. Our own conscience is telling us from inside. This is wrong. We say, no, but it's good. I like it. I'm a bad person anyway. At least it's pleasurable. At least I get some fun out of it. For whatever reason, and we take that decision, is considered to be a karma deserving a punishment. We made it up. We decided to punish ourselves by doing that. Knowing it's going to be like this, we do it to punish ourselves. Now that's standing as a punishment in the future. The punishment can come within the same lifetime or can come in the next lifetime. But it's held up there. If we say, this was a time for me to help somebody and that's a good deed I am doing. And you are establishing that moral value that I am really doing a good deed for somebody or I am helping somebody. It's a good thing I am doing. You have established a karma which will give you a reward. And will give a reward in the same life or in the next life or later on. If it's held up as a good karma. It is these moments when we deliberate and see clear choices and say, I can do this or that. And then take a decision that new karma is created, not otherwise. What you do automatically, instinctively, is not new karma. That's payoff of the old karma. Therefore, the new karma is confined to where free will has had to be used. Where you had to make a distinction between one choice and another and pick up one choice. Therefore, this, these two combinations of the problem and karma, this combination of the destiny, and new actions, works to create our future lives. But then, it's not the actual act that creates the karma. Because karma is neither held on the body, nor on the sense perceptions, but on the mind. Karma is a mental activity. The mind creates karma, and not the body. If the mind does not know when the body hits somebody, there is no karma. It's a payoff of the old one. If the mind knows, I am going to hit, it's a new karma. And if you say, I want to hit that person and don't hit, even then it's a karma. So the karma is a mental activity. It's not a physical activity. And we make that mistake sometimes, thinking, oh, it's only in my mind. But even if you are in the mind, it's still a karma. So that way, by our mental activity and making decisions in our mind, we create a lot of karma. Karma can be paid off, of course, also mentally. Mental illness mental deficiencies, they come up to pay, pay off old karma. Emotionally, we can pay off karma. We get emotionally wrecked by disappointments. We get wrecked by things not happening according to the way we want. Those are also karma. Most of them, emotional karma is from the past. But the mental karma where we decide what to do is for the future. Now, the difficulty is that if you have a set of bad karma requiring punishment and a set of good karma requiring rewards, they don't cancel each other. That is the biggest snag in this whole system. That you can't cancel. You can't say, oh, I did something bad, now let me atone for it and do good things. You're punished for the bad, you're rewarded for the good. Therefore, otherwise you could wipe out your karma. And because they both are independent, you can't do it. The story is told of Krishna, who was an enlightened avatar, an avatar, an incarnation of Vishnu, the god of sustenance of this world. And he, even from childhood, would speak up some great truths. And he was a cowherd. He used to take care of cows in the, in the pastures. And he had this very young student 
uh, not a student but a cl- classmate who used to go to village school. His name was Udo. And Udo and Krishna used to go together to look after the cows. One day, Krishna tells Udo, Udo, we cannot understand the nature of karma. He's telling as a child, Udo, we cannot understand the nature of the karma. It is so strong, holding us back. Look at this ant crawling. And he points to an ant that's crawling there. Look at this ant crawling. Looks like a little insect, little ant crawling. Twice it has been Brahma, the creator of this universe. And once it has been Indra, the lord of heaven existing. And now it's an ant because of karma. He got so much reward for the good things he did and became the creator of the three worlds. And he did so much evil that he had to come back again as insect. He says, karma is too strange. The words he used, which are now recorded are, karman ki gat nyari se. That's how they say it in eastern UP, Uttar Pradesh. And when I went to visit the land where Krishna worked and was born in that area in Uttar Pradesh, I saw poor people, the gardeners and others working there, singing in the evening. And this was the song they always sang. And this was the refrain of their songs. Are Udo Karman ki gat nyari se. Udo, you can't understand the nature of karma. It's not so easy as we think it is. And this was the whole thing. The complicated system of karma requires that we have to be here for good or bad. Yet masters have come here from time to time and have given us another way, a different way to overcome this problem. They said, if you want really, you can lead a karma-free life. How can you lead a karma-free life if you have to make decisions all the time? They say, well, leave the decision to the master. Live in God's will. Live in master's will. If you're living in God's will or Master's will, you don't make a decision. Somebody else makes a decision. If you have an enlightened good friend and he can decide things for you, don't jump in and say, I want to decide. Say, George knows best, he can decide. Your friend can uh, know better. You're not getting any decision making. This is a very important part. That if you live in God's will, in the master's will, you don't create karma because you're not making a decision. You're living by his decision. But how do we do that? How do we know what is God's will and what is our mind's will? The truth is that there is a category of living. You can live like one with mind's will and one with God's will or with Guru's will. And the two categories of people are called Manmuks and Gurmuks. Manmuk is a follower of the mind and follows how the mind decides between choices and creates karma. The Gurmuk lives on the will of the Guru and follows that and does not create karma. How do we know if a particular action we take, if a Guru is not there, God can't be seen, we can't ask him, is this your will or no? And we have to take a decision. How do we know which is God's will and which is our mind's will? There, of course, Rumi, Malana Rum, he gives an answer. He says, why do people ask me what is God's will? It's so simple. If he has placed a spade in your hand, he has expressed his will, dig. If he's given a pen in your hand, he's expressed his will, write. He has placed circumstances indicating what to do, do it, that's his will. He simplifies it. That if you live by following the circumstances and coincidences around you, coincidences themselves are an expression of God's will, if you follow them. And then, of course, more recently, the masters have further explained that there are two functions in our mind. One is the mental decision-making and the other is the intuitive decision-making. There is a difference between the two. In the mental decision making, we always take time to decide because the mind has to reason what is better or worse. 
and then take a decision. If the mind makes a decision, it's karma. Intuition does not have any time, it's a gut feeling that comes. When you follow that, no time has been taken. You have not taken a decision except the gut feeling that came and there's no karma. People who live intuitively do not create karma. People who live mentally create more karma. There's another angle to it. How do we know it's true intuition or not? Some people mistake a quick mental judgment to be intuition. One man told me, a friend of mine, I have developing my intuition. I said, I don't know how to develop. I'm very glad. You tell me, how do you develop intuition? Give me an example. He said, I'm going to give you an example. I want to decide whether I want to go to that city tomorrow or not. Now I ask my intuition to give an answer. Uh, we'll go. I said, what was that? Ah, uh, there was time. <laughs> that was exactly the time that mind takes to make a decision. This was a mental decision, not intuitive. When the intuitive hunch comes to us, there is no time. It's just sudden, completely sudden. It's the sudden hunch that comes. Is there any way to verify if we get these intuitive hunches and we get this gut feeling, is there another way to verify whether really it was intuitive? Yes. The circumstantial evidence of coincidences outside corroborates whether the intuition was right or not. And you will find this remarkable thing. When you have a hunch, a gut feeling, then you go out and try and see the same thing written on the billboard. It's a confirmation of your intuitive hunch. The more intuitive you become, the more coincidence of that kind happen. You can check them out in your life. So therefore, God speaks to us. Guru speaks to us. Master speaks to us in all these languages. And if we follow those, we are living in the Lord's will and don't create karma. So we can make, to quite a large extent, a life with much less karma than we have. So there are some guidelines to how to handle karma for a seeker, for a disciple of a perfect living master. So I am giving, giving you these little hints because they work. You can test them out, they actually work. So the fact that karma works in a certain pattern and it goes on till we die leads us to the question, how is the next life created then? What part of the karma of one life is used to create the next life? Is it just all of it going and in reflection into the next life? Not at all. Only some pieces are picked up from here and there. And from the reserve. Pieces are picked up from the reserve, pieces are picked up from here, pieces are picked up from the 10th earlier lifetime, 100th earlier lifetimes, 50th earlier lifetimes. It can be picked up from anywhere to make a new lifetime. There was a blind king in Mahabharat, in the epic story, and he was blind in the time of Krishna. And he told Krishna, with your help, I have been able to look back into 100 of my past lives. And I don't remember anything I did to be blind in this life. How come I'm blind? And Krishna says, no, you have to go further back. 104th life, earlier 4th life, 104th life, you as a king took out the eyes of a man and that's why you're blind. He says, after 104 lives, he said, there's no limit. Karma can be created from any of the past lives and brought it to make a new life. This arrangement is such that since we have had so many past lives, that we can continuously have life even if we try to live karma free. The only way the karma free life can really help us is if we are initiated by a perfect living master and he destroys the cloud of all previous lives, karma. And the only thing left is the product of the destiny made for this life. And we pay off that in this life. And whatever we create, as then we can control. If we know this is the only life that can be used to make it the next life, we have a karma-free life, live in the will of the master. You don't have a next life. What happens when you die? Most people can't tell us. Some people have near-death experiences and they tell us they saw white light, they saw tunnels and so on. The doctors and psychologists say, no, no, that's only a remembrance of their birth canal and they came out and saw the light, so they see the light when they die. It's a memory going backwards. They give some different explanations. 
what is the answer which mystics and the masters give us? They say, when you die, you suddenly find the world detracting from you, that you are being pulled away. And the whole of this life, the pictures of this life, runs like a movie in front of you. And you see all the events suddenly running in front of you. You see, oh, I did this, I did this, I did this. Very rapidly, the whole life is replayed as it were in front of you. And at that time, in the last few moments of your death, when this is happening, whatever your wishes at that time are, whatever you think of at that time is the fundamental basis of the next life. Then other things are added on to it. They say the last moments, wishes and desires are very important in establishing what your immediate next life will be like. But immediately after death, when you pull it out, when you are disembodied, if you are not an initiate, you are brought before somebody, some character who has been assigned this role because of his good karma or bad karma, who sits as the Lord of Judgment on you. And he says, you saw the picture and now I am going to tell you what and what is entailed for the next life. And he spells out, and he spells out that from the karma that you create, he tells us that it entails that you have done so much to go to hell, three days in hell, or ten days. You have done so much, you are entitled to heaven for a month. You have done so much to have these events in your life. But before we go into other forms of life that you can go into, including life forms other than human, you could go into a whole sequence of life forms starting from plant life all the way to insects, birds, mammals and human again. By your karma, you have created the cycle of rebirth in different life forms. But before any of that starts, it will always go in the same order. By the way, that order happened to be Darwinian order also. I was seeing a sudden coincidence. Before we start the Darwinian order of, not you don't have to go through all life forms, only some of the selected ones, but the order is always in the same. Before you go into that order, you decide you want to go to hell or heaven first. Last choice you are going to make with your free will. After that, till you become human, you will have no free will. But this is the last opportunity to exercise free will. Some people like to go to hell first, get it out of the way. And some want to go to heaven, maybe in heaven we may pray and avoid the hell. All kinds of thoughts come. I have sometimes in, in, in uh, these meetings taken a poll. How many people, if they got a chance that they had to go one month to heaven, one month to hell, where would they like to go first? I am going to check what is your opinion. If you all had a choice and you have to spend one month in heaven and one month in hell, how many of you would like to go to hell first? Okay, how many of you would like to go to heaven first? Pretty well divided. Thank you. That's always been my experience. It's pretty much divided. And there must be some good reasons why we have such a 50-50 uh, poll on, on this issue. But that is the last choice we get on the law of karma. After that, the different life forms we have, they have a very strange effect again on, on karma because every life form you go through leaves its imprint before you move to the next. For example, if you have a karma where you have to be a tree, you have to be wooden tree for hundred years. You stand in the garden as a wooden tree with a subdued consciousness of a tree. You can't do anything, but you're conscious that you are a tree. You're conscious of the trees around, people are there. You're conscious of that, you can't speak, you can't communicate, you can't move. You're stuck till you die. As a tree, for that long period, you carry that wooden experience to the next life. Supposing you have only two lives, tree and human, and nothing in between. That was all your karma. You will find 
yourself wooden and tree like even when you are human this carries on it's amazing every experience suppose you had the experience of being a dog before you became human the dog's attributes come up as a human being you have a tendency for them so it's not merely that they stand alone by themselves every form of life in which we appear carries its imprint into the next one and ultimately when we become human they are carrying the imprints of lot of life forms and that's why they behave in all those forms it's a very complex sanskar sanskar means the establishment of attitudes based upon all previous lifetimes sanskar is different from karma because sanskar is that is the sanskar sanskar means the accumulated effect of all the previous karma is not one events that come are one life this event happened there this is happening now but sanskar is cumulative and sanskar develop our attitude and our attitude is very uniform it hardly changes i have seen that the attitude of people does not change but with the perfectly big masters initiation it does change i have seen that so it's it's a cumulative thing how does it change with the perfect living master initiation because the very cloud carrying all the previous sinchit karma is destroyed and immediately leads to change of attitude so that's no longer affecting your attitude if you watch people closely if you watch initiates closely and i watched initiates all my life and i watched closely how they react when they come and get initiation how they are before how they are after how it happens as they progress that the distinct change of attitude comes after initiation and the attitude towards people attitude towards things begin to change so that's a, that's because of the law of karma it's all built into this particular law so karma is not that simple like it's just action reaction it has all these strange features in it if you are initiated by a perfect living master you do not go to any other life form except a human life form if you have to do you have to go to another life form not necessarily one day great master gave a discourse and he said if you are initiated by a perfect living master you will not have to go through more than four better and better human lives my dad was not there on that satsang on that discourse he heard it from somebody else and he ran to the great master and he said master i understand that you said today a person initiated by a perfect living master cannot have more than four lives is it true and master says lake raj why are you worried this is your last life why are you worried about four lives he says no i am worried that if i want a fifth one i won't get it <laughs> he said why would you think of a fifth one he said because who knows you may come again and again some people say masters come again and again you decide to come fifth one will you leave me behind great master then explained he said four lives is mentioned as a limit it not necessary for everybody to have four lives indeed if a person after initiation by a perfect living master follows the instructions of the master just follows the instructions of the master this is last life he is not reborn again if a person after initiation cannot follow fully tries but misses fails tries misses he may come for one more life which will be better lifetime where he can follow the instructions only where a person gives up the path and does not want to follow at all he comes for another third life only a person who goes against the path against the master works against the master comes for the fourth life is not that everybody has come for the fourth life most people for following the instructions of a master this is their last life and therefore this it's not this story went around that we have to have come four lives that's not true that's not according to the power of the initiation of a perfect living master he takes care of you he he can also intervene in this karma a divine intervention is possible to lighten even the existing problem of karma but what happens because of the deal that masters themselves have made 
with the lord of these regions the time frame the time machine that is running these regions because of that deal they say okay if you want your pound of flesh we'll give the pound of flesh before we go if they help a person very often they take the karma upon themselves if they find that the disciple is really in pain and agony and as human beings they have utmost compassion they are very compassionate human beings and with that compassion they don't want the person to suffer or not suffer so much they can take on but then they they pay the price but the price they pay is much less because the negative power itself is not wanting them to suffer so when they take a little suffering on behalf of their disciples the negative power itself is anxious they should not suffer so they can take a little bit and it solves a large amount of karma it takes away the large amount of karma of that disciple people have to go through some very tough karma masters they can get injured on their hands they can get injuries on their body they can fall fall sick there was a case where a man had a very heavy karma we all have very different loads of karma but one was a very heavy load of karma and could not have been ready for initiation in this life could have been ready next life with the grace of a master who darshan he had had but his friend who was a disciple of great master was very keen to give him the initiation he kept on pleading to the master master he is my friend i love my friend forget all his weaknesses you don't judge people so just initiate him and the great master said for your sake i will initiate your friend but then i'll go back straight for my cut my toe short and he initiated that person went back and had a high fever for himself which he predicted in advance so masters can take on their bodies on visible karma which we can see for the sake of the disciples some disciples say it's very unfair to load a master with our karma what kind of sikhs are we what kind of sikh disciples are we that instead of helping the master do his work we are putting our karma on the master that's not fair the question is the answer master gives is look i am helping you with this much load of karma i'll be able to do it with this little therefore it's a good deal don't worry about it but still people just loving disciples they don't want even to give that much of karma to master eventually it is all left to the discretion of the master and when we live in the will of the lord he determines how much we can take how much he needs to help us and we go through karma i have told you all these things about the law of karma because very often we don't hear these details and we think karma is a very simple process do good and you are rewarded do bad and you are punished it's much more complicated and has a cycle of events that goes with it so so far as we are concerned the best is to create as little karma as we can in this lifetime and that is by living the lord's will which means we look up and see what the coincidences are telling us what our hunch is telling us what master's talk is telling us what specific instruction he has given us are telling us follow them if you follow all these things you will be on the right track if sometimes you get confused that we have these two options we can go this way or this way and master is not here we can't contact him we can't telephone him we can't speak to him how do we know which way to go is there a rule of thumb that we can apply to what we should do the rule of thumb is look at the two options the one that brings you closer to the master is to be preferred over that which takes you away from the master the one that makes you think more of the master is to be preferred over that which does not there's a rule of thumb that you will find if you apply this rule of thumb in making your daily decisions you'll be generally quite right and therefore you'll make the right choices of course you can also in meditation 
asked the master and repeat the words of Simran. And very often, either directly in meditation or coincidentally, next day you get the answer. But then you don't have a problem because living in the will of the master. And you can create a more or less karma free life and reduce the burden and follow the instructions of the master and go back home in this very lifetime. In this age, this is called the Iron Age, the Kali Yuga. The grace and generosity of the master is flowing more than ever before. I can tell you that. This is the time to keep our cups open to get filled up. People say, why don't I get enough grace of the master? Well, grace of the master is flowing all the time. It flows like rain. When rain falls, the shower is falling. It's like grace. If you have a cup and put it upside down in the rain, it never gets filled up, no matter how much the shower is. But if you turn it around a little bit, a few drops go in, if you turn it straight up, it gets filled up very quickly. What is this cup we are talking about? This cup is the cup of our own attention. If our attention is entirely the world, it's upside down. If our attention is towards the master, it's upside down. It's up, filling up with grace. Grace is never stopping. It's our cup that we manage, our attention that we manage, which side we put it. If we put it up, it gets filled up. If our attention is on the master, day and night, walking, talking, thanking him for everything, the cup is up, the grace comes and we experience it. And if our attention is worldly, I say, Master, I tried to do this work, you didn't help me. Master, I failed in that job. Master, I couldn't do that. Your attention is all on the worldly things and all that you want is for worldly activities. Grace is there, the cup is empty because it's not turned in the right direction. So keep the cup of your attention in the direction of the Master and His grace will fill it up. I'm very happy you paid such attentive attention to what I was saying and keep it and practice what I've been saying. Keep it as a guideline. This is just guidance. It can only be actually worked out if you meditate, go within and check it out. Do not believe any word of mine unless you check it out yourself inside. That is the principle on which great masters teachings work. That you can hear these things but check them out. All these things that I say, the truth about them is lying inside you. All the questions you have, the answers are lying inside you. If you go within, you'll get the answers to all these things.